Hi, folks. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you. And thank you for joining us today, wherever you're situated in the world and whatever time you're joining us, for our conversation about the intersection of mental health and the arts. I'm Jen Kearney, and I'm a digital communications manager for McLean Hospital. And I'm joined today by two phenomenal people, Leslie Jackson Chihuly and Ariana Kerwin. And mental health and creative expression go together in many ways. Both can be your own personal preference. Both speak to your personality, your interests, your values. Both can be pretty often misunderstood by other people. And unfortunately, both still carry a pretty significant amount of stigma. Members of the art communities often vacillate between creating something that speaks to their soul and is art for themselves. But a lot of folks use art because they want to be understood and heard by others, and they're trying to use their creative work as a communication outlet. But a lot of people who are unfamiliar with the creative environment don't understand it, and even more so don't necessarily understand how they themselves can benefit from it. So these and so many more reasons are why I am really excited to be kicking off today's session. And normally I do a small introduction of each person, but quite frankly, me rattling off a biography of either one of these women will not do either any justice. So without further ado, I would love for each of you to introduce yourself and share a little bit of why the intersection of mental health and the creative arts is so important to you. And Leslie, if you'd like to kick it off, by all means, go for it. Thanks so much. And first of all, Jen, I want to thank you for putting this together. And I want to thank McLean Hospital for the invitations and opportunities um, you've given me to share my story, deepen my own healing and my sense of purpose around, around this topic, because it's so emotional for me. Um, I grew up in a home with um, substance abuse and mental illness, and art and music literally saved my life. Um, being able to go into a room and play a piano for hours on end, being able to play a flute, being able to be part of a choir, being able to sing, being able to be with other people while doing those things um, literally saved my life. So I, I feel so strongly that this idea of creative expression, the work that, that Dale and I both do in our lives, but also through organizations that we like to support, is all about giving voice and giving giving a healing opportunity to people. Thank you. Yes, and hi everyone, um, and thank you, Jen. Um, my name is Ariana Kerwin, and I, I'm so honored and excited to be here today. The subject of today's webinar plays an important role in both my personal and professional life. So I am an occupational therapist from McLean Hospital, and I also, well, I specifically work at a therapeutic day program under the McLean umbrella for children and adolescents. I also help teach mental health and pediatric courses at the MGH Institute, and I have a small private practice. Um, but prior to pursuing occupational therapy, I went to college for psychology and fine arts, specifically painting and life drawing. So earlier in life, I was on track to be a painter as a career until I fell in love with OT. Uh, I do still paint and I find the habit a necessary ingredient in my own self-care and my own well-being. Um, it also is a major influence in role how I treat the children and adolescents I work with every day. I know that both of you have creative backgrounds, but I'd love to hear a little bit about how each of you has seen a creative outlet be a mentally therapeutic tool and an avenue for healing. Um, and Leslie, I know that you talked a little bit about your upbringing, um, but I'd love to have you go first and then Ariana, you can chime in. Well, I have just seen both in my own experience how having an outlet for, um, for our pain, right? For our mental, um, pain for our anxiety is, is so key. And I've watched this work um, just transform other individuals when they are given the opportunity to come together around something like uh, glass blowing, where um, we help um, support a program called the Hot Shop Heroes. And this is a program um, which involves glass blowing at the Museum of Glass for veterans um, who are recovering from, from trauma. And the teamwork, the the, the kind of focus, the mental focus that's required, um, that element of danger that's involved in hot glass and being around the furnace 
um, has been just transformational for the people involved. And as so as an occupational therapist, I, I truly believe that creating something with your hands, um, a product that you've made, that you've, that you've built, that you've constructed, that that process in itself is therapy and can be an important element to recovery or rehabilitation or general self-care and maintenance of our well-being. Um, artistic engagement is a non-verbal form of expression and we can it can help you tap into these areas of our emotional subconscious that words or, or talk therapy can't as easily uh, get to. Um, but from a more personal experience as art, as a venue for healing, I was raised by a single mom who experiences bipolar disorder, um, several addictions, some pretty severe phobias and some past traumas in her life. And so as a child, I spent a lot of time with her in the local community theater. So I was often behind stage when she would perform and she would just shine out there. And the arts really provided her with a community where she was fully accepted as herself and it provided her with a safe outlet. And so to this day, movies and film and theater are passions of hers. And it brings so much positive energy into her life and, and our relationship together. Um, we, we bond over going to the movies or uh, talking about which ones we'll, we'll see soon or which ones we'll watch that night. Uh, it's, it's a huge part of her identity and how she manages daily life. And it's a huge part of how we stay connected together. That's, I can't, I can't describe how impactful that is. And I know that as somebody who focuses in communication, um, I did a lot of journaling when I was younger and have tried to continue the practice now, but that was how I realized that I had pretty bad anxiety because I noticed a pattern in how I was writing and it didn't seem, it didn't seem right. Like it's, it seemed like something was kind of off about it. And I realized after a while that that was anxiety and that I actually needed to seek help for it. And it's become something that has become so regulated over time that I didn't realize just how impactful my own creativity would be in being able to work toward healing myself. Um, and then the next question, Ariana, is definitely more pointed toward you because there is a clinical aspect of it. But Leslie, please feel free to chime in as well. How exactly do creative practices regulate the nervous system? Yes, that's a great that's a great question because I don't think we often think of the arts from a, a neurophysiological level. Um, but our sensory systems are the, the foundational blocks of how our nervous system develops. We start developing these core sensory systems in the womb as early as seven weeks gestation. And we immediately start collecting data on the world around us and even before we're born. So our bodies collect this data on our environment constantly, um, instantly, and without us ever really thinking about it. So, you know, simply put our senses, send messages to our brain to create a plan for how our body's nervous system is gonna react and interact with the world around us. So. When a person experiences anxiety, um, depression, stress, worry, sadness, you know, we, we feel these somatically through our senses. And when we experience the symptoms of trauma, we feel them in our nervous system through our bodily senses. So sometimes our, our nervous system isn't reacting in a functional way for us, it's really causing some, some turmoil or disruption in our daily life. And past experiences can really mold and shape our neurology. So maybe your fight or flight mechanisms or stress hormones aren't turning off easily, or your motivation to participate in daily pleasurable sensory activities has significantly decreased. Um, I think about you know eating your favorite foods or taking a hot shower or listening to good music and enjoying classic films. Um, engaging in the arts is a sensory rich experience that really engages that foundational need for our nervous system and our data collection system. So it can begin to help our bodies regulate itself, both physiologically 
And emotionally, there's a connection there. So the arts provide our nervous system with this safe, um, predictable, pleasurable data. And research shows that multi-sensory activities, you know, activities that engage several senses at once, like the arts can, um, can regulate our, our respiratory system, our stress hormone release, which is linked to anxiety and depression, our emotional regulation abilities, how we handle and, and process emotions, um, even cardiovascular reactivity and our immune system response. So our sensory system, which is the base of our nervous system, contributes to so much of, of who we are and how we behave and how we react to this world around us. It, it ultimately shapes our identity of ourself and what occupational choices we make and what we feel comfortable or uncomfortable doing, you know, what we enjoy. So on top of the many positive social and psychological responses, um, engaging in the sensory rich and sensory positive arts uh, physiologically regulates us and can organize our nervous system responses. And Leslie, I'm not sure if you wanted to chime in a little bit about your own personal experiences of seeing the creative practices regulating your own nervous system or the nervous systems of those you've cared about? Um, certainly. Well, I, you know, I play the flute and I mentioned um, playing the piano. There's something about uh, the air, you know, moving air through an instrument, touching the keys of an instrument. And it could be as simple as, um, you know, doing a rhythm on a table. You don't have to play the flute or play the piano. You could just do something simply with your with your hands and repeat a, a mantra or a, or a prayer or a favorite word and do some rhythm with your hands with it. And it, and I think, you know, when Ariana was speaking, I was thinking about this idea of repatterning, you know, by doing these things, we can kind of repattern the brain, get ourselves out of fight or flight, get our bodies and our nervous system, uh, as you said, used to something different. And I could really relate to the movies because my husband Dale's answer to just about everything is either go to work and make art or let's watch a movie. And any, <laughs> any anything that's going on uh, with me where I'm feeling stressed, he said, well, let's watch a movie. So I think we watched um, two Catherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy movies together <laughs> the other night. And he's right. It really calms you down. And um He's not a big talker anyway, but there's a way of communicating through, as you say, through film and through art that's that's really different. And you know, I mentioned you know, my own trauma, but my husband also experienced um, pretty intense trauma as a, as a teen. He lost his um, brother in an Air Force training incident and a year later um, lost his father. And he started sort of going down a path um, of, um, you know, misbehavior and kind of getting himself in trouble. And he discovered um, architecture, glass blowing, drawing. And I think for him, you know, he can feel terrible some days. I mean, he's bipolar, he can be really down some days, but he can be really up. At the end of the day, there's something to show for the pain and for the, for the cycling because he, he can make something out of it. And I think it's incredibly um, reinforcing for us when we can make something out of our, out of our pain. My next question was going to be, do either of you consider art therapy to be a viable option for folks struggling with their mental health? But to be totally honest, you've both completely answered that in your previous mm -hmm. question. And it seems like a resounding yes. So I'm actually <laughs> just going to move right into my next question. Um, Leslie, so based on your experience, I would love to hear how you think that we can work toward destigmatizing the mental health status of artists. I know not only are many people in the art communities grappling with conditions in silence, but I know that there's been a lot of folks still hesitant to be really creatively expressive out of concern for being air quote labeled. And Ariana, you will also have the opportunity to answer this question. Well, I think, you know, I look at our own stories and how long it took for, for Dale and myself to be able to say the words, let alone, you know, say them publicly and share them with other people. There was always this sort of dancing around it. And people can, pe people can tell the difference in your mood if you're bipolar, whether you're up or down, but they just use different 
language, kind of indistinct language to describe what was going on. And it's a really powerful moment when, when Dale was willing to talk about his bipolar publicly. And when I began to talk about my own and my own family's story um, publicly, that's a different level of coming to terms and, and healing. And I'm just so buoyed right now by how many people are coming out and speaking about their mental illness. And when I heard Simone Biles talk, or you hear Naomi Osaka, or you hear an actor or a painter or a doctor, you know, one of my favorite people, Kay Jamison, wrote a book about her own bipolar, and she's a, a you know, leading psychiatrist herself. So there's something really comforting to others when you can when you can speak truthfully about your mood state and your and your struggles. And I think we are getting better at doing it. I think that is where the destigmatizing happens is just in the doing it, talking about it, doing what we're doing today. Yes, I totally agree, Leslie. And I think additionally to add to trying to destigmatize this idea is also it's important to widen our lens of what art is. And um, you know, it's not penniless painters and buskers on the street. You know, there's a whole world of technology and and graphic design and, and anime and and animation and film and theater. And I even my mind goes to music composition and DJing. And um, I think of my grandmother and her flower arrangements and uh, do it yourself projects at home and home, you know, sewing, fashion, textiles, uh, just to widen our lens of what constitutes the arts and realize that it lives all around us and it's what gives our life color and, and meaning. And it's important to everyone. I think that's a really poignant way of phrasing it. One of my colleagues at McLean runs, he has obsessive compulsive disorder and is very open about his diagnosis, but also runs a not-for-profit in which he works with people to draw out their anxieties and concerns. And if you are interested, it's called Draw Your Monster. And he personifies what people are the most worried and fearful about. And he helps turn them into like silly monsters. So when they're personified, they're not as scary. And I feel like that avenue of him openly talking about his condition, as well as engaging other people and being more open about it and using art as an expressive outlet has just been really transformative in terms of working toward destigmatizing mental health, but also using art as a therapeutic form of talking about what's ailing you. Um, so my next question, Ariana, I would love to start with you is what advice do you have for individuals looking to explore the arts as a therapy form, but they're unsure where to start? And Leslie, you will have the opportunity to answer as well, considering you have such a wide array of your own experience in the creative arts. Well, Jen, that's such a great question, I think, because it can be really daunting to start any new habit. Um, so my mind goes to, you know, exploring the limitless amount of modern day tools to get started. There's so many free YouTube tutorials or um, Bob Ross reruns or um, something my art professor always said that if you're, if you're stuck on an idea, uh, copy art that already exists that you really like. Um, it doesn't have to be original. There's no need to reinvent the wheel uh, for the last few thousand years of art, right? And there's, um, there's a lot of ideas already out there. If you find something that really you're drawn to, try and copy it. Um, there's also really beautiful paint by number kits now, especially ones that you can choose like a picture of your own pet. And our pet can be a really huge source of inspiration. Um, and I guess on top of those ideas, something I personally do is I often will go to Savers or Goodwill and get framed art that already exists or uh, canvases that have already been painted on and paint right over them. Um, you know, find cheap furniture at Goodwill that could be refurbished. There's a lot of free things out there uh, on the side of the road or do-it-yourself projects around the house. Um, I mentioned, you know, even floral arrangements, cooking, homemade cards, the options are, are limitless and uh, it can be a personal outlet 
kind of reserved just for you and your private time, but it can also be a social experience that includes the support and love for others or from others too. So, you know, explore your community programs that are usually free or pretty cheap or classes around you if you have a hard time initiating on your own. Um, the hardest part is just getting started. So if you can get your supplies or actually schedule and set aside the time to dive in, um, I feel like that's more than half the battle. Um, it's, you know, it takes energy to burn energy and then energy in motion remains in motion. So um, that and try not to take yourself too seriously. Like we were saying, find the, find the humor and the silliness in it. It doesn't have to be a serious piece of art and, and humor can be a powerful tool in itself. So just try and keep it simple and just get started somewhere. I love that, Ariana. I think um, ditto to everything you said and all of the incredible resources that are so easily accessible now, whether it's online or in the community. But also I'm thinking about movement, um, dance, you know, ways to get to loosen yourself up and get yourself into a state of mind where maybe you could do a piece of writing or paint, you know, put on a great piece of music and just dance, <laughs> do some movement, do some yoga, do some good breathing to get yourself uh, kind of over the hump. And I agree, we take the capital A out of artist, you know, put a little A in there. We're all, we can all be artistic. We can all be creative. Uh, we're all drawn to different things, but, but the key is that getting your hands, getting your body into it and doing that, that regulating that happens through, you know, your breathing and through that mindfulness that happens when you're focused on something new. I, Leslie, you've teed me up beautifully for my next question. <laughs> so I did want to hear from both of you. I will start with Ariana. Um, in what ways clinically or personally have you seen art be a practice of mindfulness? I know a lot of times mindfulness, especially in this day and age has become meditation apps and coloring books. And that, that tends to be what a lot of folks are mar get marketed toward them. But how have you seen art be a practice of mindfulness in your own way? Again, that's a great question. I think the word mindfulness, like you've said, is a word that's been dragged through the mud a little bit the past few mm -hmm. years um, and has a lot of preconceived ideas about it. Um, I even, you know, I work with children and adolescents and the second you say that word, their eyes glaze over. Um, it's been just, you know, it's, it's been said a lot uh, without a lot of real deep understanding of what the different ways that you can practice it and what it might look like. So the, the process of engaging in the arts by default can be a practice in mindfulness because it pulls the creator into the moment and forces you to be present with, with what you're doing. Uh, mindfulness does not have to be meditating on the floor every morning. Um, it can be ingrained in your daily activities. So being present and being clear-minded uh, allows your body and mind to experience the sensory pleasures that the world is offering you, um, whether that's, you know, being mindful while you eat a good meal or being mindful while you take a warm shower or being fully immersed in a craft or an art project or a movement. Um, this engagement allows us to be fully present and, and intentional and feel, and feel fully in control of our sensory experience. And it can be very powerful to feel present and, and in control of a moment, which in itself is a practice in mindfulness. I love your new definitions of mindfulness because I agree. I, when I hear the word, I, I think, well, I sort of, I think I know what it is, but it has been bandied around so much, but coming back to, you know, the idea of being present, right? Having, being something that is so immersive that you can't be doing or think, you know, doing other things or thinking about other things while you're doing it. I feel that when I'm skiing, for example, there's danger involved. <laughs> so I can't be uh, distracted when I'm skiing down a, a, a slippery, icy slope. I'm going to be completely present and completely focused. And so that to me is kind of this extreme version of what, what that is for me. But um, kind of on the daily basis, it's like you say, making time, setting time aside in your calendar to journal. As you were saying, Jen, I started doing that at the beginning of the pandemic and I just set up a time each day to, to do some journaling and I hadn't done it in a long time and I need to get back to it. But, um, but it helped me just be present with what I'm feeling and because I had to sort of take a, 
spiritual inventory when I sat down to do that. I think that's great. I joke with my partner when I'm writing mm-hmm. or if I'm like repainting a bedroom or something that I'm like, I'm putting the art in cathartic. Let me do my thing. <laughs> I'd love to hear from both of you in which, in what ways being creative has been a source of self-care for you. And I know we've touched upon this a little bit, but just working toward um, redefining what self-care is, because again, in this day and age, it's a lot of bubble baths and face masks. And we all know that that is really not what self-care is. Um, And Leslie, if you'd like to start by answering, I'd love to hear from you first. You know, for me, I'm such a, I'm a doer and I'm a producer and I, you know, I run our business and I sit on a lot of boards. So for me, it is um, a symbol of self-care when I take time out to do something that's really just about me and my, my art, whether it's taking a flute lesson or practicing or trying to pick up a new instrument or something like that, because those are the things I will push I will often push to the side because I'm so busy kind of taking care of others. So when you're a caregiver, right, to organizations or to a family, um, for me, it's been really important to kind of switch, switch the table and start thinking about what, what would that look like for me to really express myself creatively and what are some of my dreams? And I I get scared thinking about it because I would love to be a DJ, for example, (laughs) there are certain things I would love to do and try. Um, but that self-care kind of happens when you when you focus time for yourself just to do your creative work. Yeah. Additionally, I I I see my time to paint as um, a place to be mindful and intentional, but also to to work through a hard day or a difficult emotion. I I see it as um, one of my more healthy addictions. Right. Um, it it can it's as addictive as running or exercising. It's, it's a, it's a coping skill and it's a healthy one. So it's, it's consistently available to me. Um, it's, it's self-reliant. It's on my time, no one else's and it's nonverbal, which I, you know, I've heard a few say today, like I'm, I'm not much of a talker in terms of my own self as well. Um, so it has really become, you know, I can feel it in my body when I haven't painted in a while and it, it becomes obvious and, you know, my body, my body recognizes it as a pattern now. So I can feel a release even the second I start painting. Um, It's become ingrained in a part of my self-care. I think that's amazing. Um, I'm curious, Ariana and Leslie, please also feel free to weigh in, but Do you have any advice for folks that are looking to explore the arts, but have a hard time with not being good at things? A lot of times kids are a little bit more fearless when it comes to this stuff, but many adults who either have clinical anxiety or just are are a little bit more anxious people have a hard time trying things out of fear of embarrassment, failure, or even being mocked by their peers. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, I think we have, you know, art can be so subjective, but at the same time, um, make us feel so vulnerable. Um, I think an important note is that you don't want to, you don't need to be making refrigerator art. Um, The expectation shouldn't be to create something that you're going to be super proud of and you want to hang in your house. I mean, if that does happen, that's wonderful. Um, but the process is the therapy, not the, not the product. So um, my suggestion to get started, if you're worried about uh, the outcome of the art experience, then create something and throw it away. Uh, give it away. Donate it to Goodwill. Uh, rip it up. Um, safely burn it. Uh, paint, paint over it. Paint over it again and again and again. But do, but do create it and keep creating it. it it makes me think of artists like Picasso or Van Gogh where they've you know new x-ray technology has found paintings under paintings under paintings um, and it's it's more important to create than to preserve uh, the focus is really on the the process not the product I'm just thinking that it it starts with the self-talk. You know, you do this self-talk. I'm not good enough. You know, I don't want to show people this. Um, they're much more talented than I am. If you can just put that to the side and and really 
commit to the fact that this is for you. This is your time. This is your, this is your energy. This is your outcome. It's not performative really for others. Doesn't need to be. And like you say, if it's great at the end of it and you love it and you want to put it on a refrigerator or send it to a friend, you can, but think about it. as just being for you. So I'm curious, we've had folks right in who have art backgrounds and have a really hard time with being what they've called air quote, ugly artists. So do you, either one of you have any thoughts or advice about letting go of their inner critic in the process of making art or instead of trying to block out the sound, how do we talk back to our inner critic to make it a little bit less critical? And Ariana, I'm not sure if you'd want to start answering. Um, you may have a little bit more clinical experience with this, but I'd love to hear from both of you. And my mind goes to, uh, you walk through a museum and there's all types of ugly art that you see where people just adore it. It's, art is so subjective. And so while we have this you know, inner critic think there also lives inside of you an inner coach that lives somewhere in you too. So, um, you know, the devil and the angel on your shoulders type of deal. So I guess while, you know, politely pay attention to whatever feelings you're having, try and find a way to, to funnel that and use that emotion to create something. And you might be surprised with the outcome even eventually, essentially how you feel as the outcome too. I just agree with you, Ariana, that it's about that self-talk. I love the idea of the coach, you know, versus the critic and um, just getting yourself over the hump, realizing that it, it is for you. It's not for anybody else. And uh, you get to take the pleasure in it and you get to decide when to do it. You get to decide how and if to share it. And it's very empowering that way. Do either one of you have advice for when others minimize the effect of what we're creating? Someone wrote in saying that they quilt and embroider and that one of their close friends just whenever they show their work to them really doesn't see what air quote the big deal is. Um, and Ariana, you might have a little bit more experience in this um, based on what your patients are saying, but again, would love to hear from both of you. Any advice for this person? Well, my immediate reaction is that's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, you don't have to show your art to someone who's not giving you that support and, and love. It's, again, it's the creation process that matters. And if it means something to you, then that really all is all that matters. And maybe they're just a little jealous of your skills. Um, but and, I mean, in all seriousness, uh, my suggestion would be, again, that that inner coach versus inner critic, try not to let it get under your skin and you know, uh, which wolf are you going to feed that day, right? The, the inner critic or the inner coach. So just try and feed that inner coach a little more. I would say that's their problem. <laughs> and I would, I would really reconsider the relationship if that were somebody that I was friends with, because that's unkind. And, you know, you're, you're putting something out there. You're, you're vulnerable. You're making your quilts. You enjoy the process. It, it's really their problem if they don't appreciate it. Yeah. And it's also, you know, it's an investment in yourself. So just because you're investing something in yourself doesn't mean that you need to invest that time or communication in anybody else who may not necessarily understand it. Um, out of curiosity, could each of you talk a little bit about arts usefulness and building perseverance? So based on both of your backgrounds and previous conversations that the three of us have had, I know that you both have experience in this, but Leslie, if you'd like to answer first, that would be amazing. I think of it as, um, you know, art making or creative expression or being a musician or being a writer is all about developing a practice. So practice in itself um, means you're going to come back to it. You're going to keep coming back to it every day or every week or every year, it's going to be that little, little voice that says, Hey, you know, you're really a writer or you're really a quilt maker. you got to get back to that. Or we talked to Ariana earlier, you've got to get back to your painting. So it creates this perseverance and resilience just by nature of the fact that you've got to come back to it. Yes. I love that, Leslie. I, um, we've talked about patterns a few times today and recognizing patterns. You know, our brain seeks patterns and it recognizes comforts and it recognizes stressors based on our memory, based on experience. 
So if you could start to help your body associate that artistic expression as a positive, um, safe, valuable experience, then it will become a recognizable comfort. And we're, we're very adaptable creatures. And uh, in my mind, adaptation skills are essentially coping skills for our modern world. And, and our senses are tools for the toolbox for learning new coping skills. So the arts gives your senses this nutrients that it needs. I have, you know, art food for your toolbox of perseverance. I love that. I love art food. I just love food, but I love art food. <laughs> Um, I'm curious if either of you have suggestions for artistic outlets for young adults with cognitive disabilities. Um, and Ariana, if you'd like to answer first from the clinical or personal perspective, that would be awesome. Absolutely. A lot of my students that I work with experience cognitive delays or deficits and, um, especially in the world of maybe executive functioning and knowing where, but I think that's the beauty of art in itself is there is no start and end. There is no right or wrong way to do something. And if you're focusing on the sensory experience itself, getting your hands messy, moving your body, um, just getting some expression out, then that really is the goal versus focusing again on, on the product that comes out of it. Um, I even, uh, the other day started working with some movement, um, doing boxing with, to music and just to see, you know, something that might not even be labeled as, as art, uh, uh, traditionally, um, to see the outcome of a kid, just get that expression out. So really just, just kind of reframing the goal of not, not creating something necessarily, but, but engaging in in the expression of it and um, making it look different. So it doesn't have to be that traditional lens of what art is. Um, it can be something that's really tailored to their likes um, that they might not even realize that they're engaging in something so profound or expressive. Might just, you know, I, when you work with kids, especially one of a child's occupations is play. And play is a really important element in, I think, adults too, but especially in, in a kid's life. So if we can also um, make it more playful and be a play experience, I think that could go a long way as well. I love the idea of play. I think that's, that is key, you know, and I think, you know, there, we're all different kinds of learners. We all have different kinds of brains. Some are going to um, benefit much more from, from music and movement, or like I said, rhythm, you know, just simple rhythm to sort of reset, reset the brain can be very powerful. Listening to a beautiful piece of music and really listening can really help sort of reset the brain. Other people might do things repetitively. You see, you know, Kusama's art, right? You see all those, all those dots, right? This is a um, artist who lives in a, in a mental institution in Japan, but she has used art and repetition as a way of expressing, you know, her, herself. And I feel like art, in addition to allowing folks to be meditative and playful and present and work through things, it can also help you get a little bit lost in yourself and help you rediscover yourself. Uh, do either one of you have any thoughts or experience on this rediscovery path? Um, and Leslie, if you would like to start first, by all means. Okay, what was the first part of the question again? So <laughs> that in art, in addition to allowing you to be playful and mindful and present and working through your challenges can help you get lost in yourself and or rediscover yourself. Um, do you have any experiences or opinions on this journey of rediscovery? Well, I love, you know, that moment of feeling lost in myself or lost in the moment or completely, you know, focused on something. And I think for me, it sort of comes back to music and, you know, you could be a trained musician and be used to reading off the page, but what's really fun for me sometimes is just to let myself play without a piece of music in front of me and just see where my fingers go. I think that's, that can be inspiring. Um, absolutely. And I, I, some of the 
kids I work with, um, I think they label themselves as uh, I'm not creative or I'm not artistic and um, giving them, again, the, the venues of how it might look different or feel different. And it doesn't always have to be this traditional view of what art is, um, can really go, go a long way. Um, just the other day I had, uh, was working with a student who really likes scary movies and he's never touched a piano, but just trying to figure out how to play scary music on a piano, he got so immersed in it. And again, you can see he got lost in the, the process. And um, I think when we come out of that experience, it can feel very relieving and kind of like a weight off of us. We might not even realize how many different activities uh, are available to us that could provide us with that type of feeling. Curiosity, and this can be answered by both of you. Um, Leslie, as you are a parent and Ariana is soon to be a parent, um, how do you encourage rather than demand a child to engage in art? And from a personal standpoint, I would love to hear this as someone who begrudgingly did things because my mother told me to, sorry, mom, Uh, but Ariana, if you would like to go first, I think this is information we could all really benefit from. Yeah, so um, a big part is the the flexibility in your plan. Um, I think it's important to let kids get messy. And if that means the space that they're in gets messy too, we have to be flexible with that idea. If, you know, if we're having um, a, a cooking activity or an art activity with materials, just allowing the space to get as messy as it's gonna get. I think that's one thing that parents Um, can feel a little rigid about is letting either their child get their clothes ruined or um, letting the space become a disaster. But I think that is an important sensory part of the experience. Um, So it's a small little piece of advice, but if we could be flexible about letting kids be messy, I think that's an important part of the art experience. Sometimes you have a kid like ours, he's a young man now who, you know, from a very early age was just very perfectionistic about what he was doing. So he would start a drawing and if it didn't match what he had in his head, he would just rip it up. You know, I, I remember seeing this tra- you know, trash basket full of, you know, hundreds of pieces of paper because it, it just wasn't living up to what he had in his head. Um, you know, I encouraged him to, play music I just wanted him to have an instrument and have music in his life so um, really worked at that for a long time with um, both piano and guitar but he would feel so badly about himself if he hadn't practiced that when the teacher would come he would he would want to run to the other end of the house and and not take the lesson so I mean these are tough things because and you know some of some kids are just born with these kinds of you know um difficult perfectionistic qualities. So I love the idea of getting messy, but he's a neatnik. He would never really let his space get messy. And I don't know if that really was my fault or something I did, or if it's just something in him. My husband, on the other hand, has no problem being messy, spraying paint all over the place, trying new things. I I love that, you know, about him because he's, you know, doesn't care if the paint's all over his clothes or his shoes. In fact, he he prefers it that way. So I think just, you know, we're all a little different in the way that we, you know, find the path into, into art. My son now is more into photography. That sort of seems to suit his, you know, his, you know, his type of brain, maybe a little better. Out of curiosity, do either of you have any knowledge about how art can help folks who are incarcerated? Um, And certainly either one of you can feel free to answer this. I'm not familiar with how much either one of you may know about it. I just imagine that, you know, whether you're incarcerated or you're um, suffering from any other kind of trauma or mental illness that, that you've got time. If you are incarcerated, you probably have time to to read, to write, to listen to, I don't know what the access would be to music, but certainly I don't, and I don't know what tools or whether you can have pens or pencils. So I really am not, you know, too familiar, but I would imagine that they're be super helpful. 
Um, yeah, similarly, I'm not too familiar, but I do, I do believe that we don't do enough to help the incarcerated populations prepare for when they leave and feel ready to, you know, and stable to be on their own and be ingrained back into their communities. Um, again, the art world can be such a strong coping skill. And I think um, as much as we can help uh, people who are incarcerated prepare for the transition, the better. And I don't, again, I don't think we do enough. Um, so any type, any level of coping and expression that we can provide a person, I think the better. We had somebody write in who asked about having any tips for folks with OCD that experience anxiety, stress, and perfectionism when engaging in creative activities. And Leslie, if you would like to answer first, I know you had just alluded to the fact that your son has a perfectionist streak in him. Um, and then Ariana, if you'd like to follow up with some clinical advice, that would be terrific. Um, well, I just think you've got to find the, the media and the medium that sort of suits your kind of brain. And I think, you know, we can be really flexible and try a lot of different sorts of things, but the important thing is just to, to keep trying, keep, keep exploring that. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think the medium choice is such a huge role, especially for someone who might uh, be a perfectionist or be focusing more on, on the product or the outcome. Um, it makes my mind goes to, you know, expressive arts that are more physical or don't necessarily have a, a product at the end of it. Um, it's more about focusing on the moment and, and what you're doing that, and it doesn't have this, this end product necessarily, except for the feeling. So someone wrote in saying, while I appreciate the value of celebrities sharing their mental health challenges, I don't feel like there's much societal process in accepting and addressing the challenges that non-famous people are encountering. Do either of you have advice or thoughts on how the arts can address this? And Leslie, since I know that you are so heavily immersed in the arts, I'd love for you to start answering. Yeah, I just, you know, every organization that I'm involved with, whether it's the Pilchuck Glass School or Path with Art or Museum of Glass, you know, it's so much of the focus now is on, you know, providing access to art experiences to people who are suffering from trauma, from mental illness, um, homelessness, et cetera. So while, you know, I, I agree that, you know, the celebrity, you know, broadcasting of mental illness is not the most helpful thing. It does, it does serve as a sort of a uh, liftoff point for conversation. I think the more we can get into conversation, the more our organizations begin to get focused on, on that as a need. And I, I just, I think there's been a shift in organizations thinking about how to work with people around the, the creative and the, and the art. So Path with Art, for example, is, is one of the organizations that I'm really involved with. And I first came to know of them because of a project, a partnering project they did with the symphony. And there was a group of about 15 people, you know, recovering from trauma and homelessness and addiction who worked with a local artist to make their own instruments and ultimately to write a piece and to perform it, you know, in the in the living room of, of the symphony. So it's sort of elevating, you know, the stories of, of the people that live in the streets of our cities and, and really bringing that forward and talking to people and being willing to um, give a voice, give, give a place for those stories to be told. Beautifully worded, Leslie. I don't have much extra to add, just that um, you know, the more platforms that we can have in our world for open dialogue about mental health, the better. So while not everyone's life is parallel to a celebrity's, um, it still is, uh, providing even, you know, mini platforms for people to start talking and, and reaching out to their communities. Exactly. Could not have said that better myself between the two of you. Um, Ariana, the next question is directed 
basically toward you. Um, are there particular instances where you might use art as an intervention in a clinical setting? And if so, how do you recognize somebody as being open to art therapy as an intervention? Yeah, absolutely. So I see it more as an occupational therapist in my setting. I see it more of a, a sensory experience or that sensory integration and processing activities and how I set that up and um, how I implement that is really based on, you know, everyone has a very individual sensory profile. Um, so we do have standardized assessments that kind of give the foundation for where to start. But I see it more as um, setting up a sensory experience. And so whether that be something to get your hands messy, something to move your body, um, you know, thinking about tapping into that multi-sensory experience of all those senses. Um, I look at it in the lens of, of creating a positive and safe sensory experience more so than um, creating an art therapy experience. Out of curiosity, um, is there any form of art expression that should be cause for concern? Um, Ariana, I feel like this is a question directed more toward you as well, that if our child or loved one is creating things that are erring on the side of sad or morbid, should we have a conversation about their mental well-being? I think that it's a really great outlet for sad and deep emotional hard feelings. And so like, I personally, I love sad music. It's something I, I go to because it feels like an expression for me too. I wouldn't be alarmed and unless, you know, there's something that implies self-harm or um, something dangerous for them or someone around them, in which case, you know, that you could bring that to their providers or have a conversation with them about it. Um, but in terms of you know, creating art or creating something that's just generally sad. I think that's a really great outlet for them. I know from my own experience, I, when I am feeling particularly anxious and it's a way for me to work through that and ultimately feel better in the end, my writing is sad. It is a little despondent at times, but I know that it's something that I'm, I'm just working through. And that's my form of expression to get through to the other side and have a smile on my face and actually mean it. Um, the next question I'd love to start with you, Leslie, is how can we turn art into a social activity rather than a solo or isolating activity? I love that because the, the myth of the artist toiling away, you know, in the studio alone, there are people who like to work alone and can sustain long periods of, of working alone and that suits and, and fills them. But for a lot of us, we need the stimulation of being either part of a team or part of a group. And Dale, for example, is, is, is that person. You know, he gets energy from being with the team and trying things in the, in the glass shop. Same thing when he's, when he's painting. There's a symbiotic, energetic kind of exchange going on that, that is more creative for him, for him. And for me, I think, you know, um, playing music together with people, playing duets with my flute teacher feels so great. It's so different. It's sort of like the ice cream for all the work you do when you're, when you're practicing on your own, which you do need to do. But I, I love the idea of coming together around movement, coming together around making music, even coming together. You've probably seen um, some of these um, events where, you know, you put the headphones on and everybody's sort of in their own world, but they're everybody's in the room dancing together. It's just so incredible, just transcendent. So I think you get to a transcendent place when you, when you can do things in a group sometimes. And then Ariana, any thoughts about ways to turn art into a social activity over a solo one? Yeah, you know, Leslie really nailed it on the head. It, art can be such a personal experience for you, uh, but don't forget that you have options to be supported in your community um, around other people who have similar interests and, and similar motivations. And so like I, earlier, I gave the example of community theater or classes in your community, or even just getting a group of friends together um, for a paint night. Um, it, it can be really satisfying and valuable to have other people involved in your process too. And I know that we are creeping up at the end of our time together. Um, I'd love for each of you to have the opportunity to share any last words of wisdom with folks tuning in. Um, Ariana, if you'd like to go first and then Leslie after you. 
Yeah, just thank you for having me today. Um, please <laughs> go create, you know, get started somewhere and, you know, keep trial and erroring and, and ripping up and throwing away and creating again and, and just get started somewhere. Thank you guys so much for doing this. I've learned so much um, getting to know Ariana a little bit through this. And, and Jen, your questions are profoundly good and, and challenging. And I, I really appreciate that. Um, and likewise, you know, I just, you know, we all have a certain amount of time on this earth and we get to use it um, to connect, to heal, to tell our stories. And, you know, there's no time like the present to get going with it. I think, you know, if we could all come back to the same group in another couple of weeks or a month, it would be fun to hear from everybody. What, what did you try? What did you, what did you put on the line, you know, since we had this discussion? And I, likewise for myself, I'm going to recommit to my journaling. I'm going to recommit to playing my music. I'm going to recommit to continuing to share my story, even though it's scary sometimes. Absolutely. I cannot tell you mm. how anxious I get talking about my own anxiety <laughs> on here. Um, but, um, it's, but it's something that's, it's something that's important. You know, we have an infinite amount of opportunities, but we only have a finite amount of time. And I think that that's a really valuable way to say, go out there and make the most of it and create in a way that speaks to your soul. And you're going to find people who gravitate toward you if you're speaking to their soul as well. Um, I know that we have cre we've crept just over the hour, so this actually concludes the session. I joke that I can't believe that this is my job because I get pinch me <laughs> moments. This was a pinch me hour. So uh, Ariana and Leslie, I cannot thank the two of you enough for all of the insight that you've provided with everyone today. And to everybody tuning in, this actually concludes the session. So until next time, be nice to one another, but most importantly, be nice to yourself. Ariana and Leslie, thank you so much again and take care. Thank you.